Italian leaders attacked the French president over immigration. In recent days, two senior politicians have called Emmanuel Macron a terrible president and accused him of impoverishing Africa. So what is behind this dispute? And is it politics at play? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. Italy and France have long been close allies and fellow founding EU members. But relations have taken a turn for the worse since Italy's populist parties came to power in June. Much of the dispute has been about immigration. France has criticized Italy for not allowing rescue boats carrying refugees and migrants to dock along its Mediterranean ports. And on Monday, it summoned Italy's ambassador after the Italian Deputy Prime Minister Luigi Di Maio accused France of creating poverty in Africa and forcing mass migration to Europe. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. First, here's more of what the Italian leader had to say. If today we still have people leaving Africa, it is due to several European countries, France above all, who has never stopped colonizing African countries. France is printing a currency of its own in dozens of African countries, and with that currency, French debt is financed. If France didn't have African colonies, it would be the 15th world economic power. Instead, it's among the leading ones. I stopped being hypocritical by talking just about the effect. And I decided to start talking about the causes. The European Union should sanction all those countries, like France, that are impoverishing African countries and obliging those people to leave. The place for African people is Africa, and not at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Italy's Interior Minister Matteo Salvini used social media to go after the French leader on Tuesday. In a video that appeared on his Facebook page, he strongly criticized Manuel Macron's position on migrants. The argument is not against the population, the citizens, the workers, but it is against Macron, who is all words and no action. He lectures us about generosity, goodness, hospitality, solidarity, and then he rejects thousands of migrants at the Italian border. I hope the French will soon be able to get rid of a very bad president. They have a chance to do that on the May 26, when they can take their future back, their destiny, their pride, which are not well represented by a character like Macron. Fourteen countries in West Africa still use a colonial-era currency called the CFA, and this is part of the reason why some say these countries still pay a colonial tax. The CFA was first pegged to the French franc, and now it's pegged to the euro to provide stability. That's according to France, which means these 14 countries deposit their currency reserves at the French Central Bank in Paris and have access to only 15 percent of it. The remaining 85 percent of the reserves can be borrowed at market rates. These countries which use this system are Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Ivory Coast, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Togo, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. Let's bring in our guests now in Paris, Adama Guy, journalist, author, and Africa analyst in Saint-Malo, France. Joining us on Skype, Jacques Roland, head of European research at the Global Policy Institute. And in Milan, Matteo Villa, research fellow with Europe and Migration Programs at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. Uh, thank you all for joining us. So we just laid out there some of the numbers associated with how this uh, the CFA works. So let's um, start with that and then we'll broaden it out. Um, I'm going to start with you, Adama. Do you think that when DeMeo, the things that he said about Paris essentially holding um, Africa and the former colonies hostage by way of something like this, um, this currency, how would you characterize that? Do you, do you think he went too far or do you think he's right? I think he's right. I think uh, what he said is the, that uh, France has not completed uh, it's decolonization process. It had left African countries, but while maintaining behind it a new colonial system, processes that allows it to take advantage of those countries, hapless countries, and not giving them a chance to freely decide on their fate, whether on monetary issues or even on geopolitical alignment or a inter internal 
political management, France is still mingling with those countries' fate. They decide on the outcome of elections. They maintain who they want to be their stooge, and they manage to ensure that their companies, their enterprises, the likes of Total, the likes of uh, Buigs and others, come into those countries and take over the, the contracts, public contracts, while uh, their leaders have to always uh, seek advice from France. For instance, every time there is in Washington uh, this uh, meeting of the IMF World Bank, uh, either in April or in September, the French African ministers, Francophone ministers, have to come through Paris to talk to the French Minister of Finance to coordinate their uh, positions. So this is neo-colonialism. This is actually colonization, and this is okay. hampering the development of these countries. Okay. At the end. Yes. Okay, Dom. I want to bring up Jacques into this. Jacques, I, I'd like some of your thoughts on that. And what does it say that this that this CFA still exists? The, the CFA still exists because countries which are part of the CFA want to remain in the CFA. Uh, the CFA has 14 countries. Anyone can leave anytime they want, but they don't want to leave because they have some benefits from the CFA. Uh, the CFA was created in 1939 as 14 countries, most of them French-speaking, but not all French-speaking countries are part of it. And what the previous talker was talking about is more the trial of the France-Africa relationship, France-Afrique, which I know is critical. But it is, can be criticized uh, with good reason. As for the franc CFA, let's first look at a cost-benefits analysis. It's true, it is a symbol of colonialism, of French presence, and therefore uh, is not very good for the feeling of sovereignty of this country, which will think more dependent. Yes, it's true. That is quite... Uh, and from time to time, it means that the parity of the currency is not in the hands of the country, so they can't have an independent monetary policy, devalue what they want, and print money. But that has advantages for this country. It, bring, it means that it brings stability to these countries. They, as I said, they can't print money. It's linked, it's tied to the euro, and therefore it brings also credibility to uh, the current Jacques, countries, let me ask you, which, let me ask you this, how, other... how is the, yeah. the debate about the CFA seen in France? Is it, is it an issue? No, it's not a big issue in France. It's not a big issue at all. Uh, it's an issue for specialists. Uh, people know about the CFA when they go to Africa. It's quite convenient. You know exactly what uh, uh, the, you're going to pay for, etc. It has benefit for the many people who go in France of Africa, it's a benefit for businesses, it's true, but it's not seen as an issue because it's not an issue which has been raised by Af by many Africans themselves. I know they are opponents, but I think they are more opposed to the symbolic value of that. Okay. And let's not forget that it, the CFA is a very good tool of uh, regional integration and cooperation. All countries in these areas share the same currency. They can trade together. They lose some independence. It's okay, true. okay. Jacques. But at the same time, they have many benefits, and that's why country, okay, one Jacques, country left Jacques, it, Jacques, Jacques, it to Mali and rejoined it. So Jacques, I want to give... I understand, I understand. Uh, Matteo, I'm, I'm going to bring you in in a moment. For Just just bear with me. I want uh, to give Adama a chance to respond, and then um, I'm going to bring you into the conversation as well. Adama? Yes, of course. It's, uh, it's all well and good to say that there are some advantages of the CFA as a single block for the 14 or 15 francophone countries. But this is in opposition, on the one hand, to the African countries being involved in regional integration that this gentleman was talking earlier about. Because under ECOWAS and under the African Union, they want to put in place African currencies, continental ones, starting with regional currencies at the level of ECOWAS, for instance, to talk of West African countries. How can you maintain the CFA franc when you strive to build a regional currency in West Africa? This is against the will of the Francophone and overall West African countries. Secondly, it prevents these countries from having at the end of the day, an access 
to this key monetary policy that is essential in economic management. You cannot, over 60 years after independence, let a foreign nation, whether it's France, America, or China, decide on your fate. We must end this neo-colonial process. It's a, it's a must. And the French people need to know that the same way people again in France are demonstrating against the way they have been ma uh, managed over the past uh, 30 or 40 years, within Africa there are forces that would want to see really a reset. Okay. A reassessment okay. of the relationship between France and the rest of the continent. All right, so let me bring in uh, Matteo. Matteo, what do you think make of the fact that there are Italian leaders dipping into this issue? What is it really about? <laughs> Well, I must tell you, I, must, I feel like the odd man out. I mean, this is a debate that the French must have with the, their former colonies. And yes, I agree that there are you know, two sides to this issue. But uh, uh, I mean, I could express my opinion. But I think that Italy, in the end, uh, and Di Maio and then Salvini... Who are so expressing are their opinions. Vice, mini <laughs> ...vice prime ministers. They are voicing their opinions. And, uh, you know, clearly this is a matter for other countries to, to solve. Uh, to voice an opinion on uh, decolonization uh, for a country that clearly has had, uh, I mean, a colonial past as well, clearly not as developed as France, but we colonized Libya, we colonized Ethiopia, we colonized Eritrea and Somalia. And uh, so to voice an opinion about, uh, let's say, post-colonial ties is clearly out of place. And this uh, is uh, clearly a response to the fact that each, uh, 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 each uh, politician in Italy is trying to use France and the political debate there to uh, simply, you know, uh, advance their own position for the European elections. So you so think for, this is, this is about DCFA, local politics? There are costs and benefits. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so it may be about local politics, but local politics in, in Italy and in France and in much of Europe right now very much um, pivots or centers rather on on immigration. So the 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 points that these gentlemen have made has definitely opened up a, a broader discussion. Um, on how the EU has handled immigration. What is, what is Italy's main bone to pick with France about this? I mean, clearly there has been uh, some bones of contention that are totally right. For example, you know, at, the, uh, at the borders between Italy and France, we've had um, people coming back, being sent back from France, uh, refoiled to Italy without uh, being able to ask for asylum in France. We also know there are, that France has uh, some bones of contention with Italy, meaning that uh, uh, French authorities bring in migrants back to Italy have a say, uh, they say, I mean, uh, they, they usually say, well, if we let people ask for asylum in France, they, we would ne never be able to return them to Italy because Dublin, the Dublin rules that regulate asylum seekers within Europe and their relocation or not, where they should file or claim asylum, uh, they do not work. So France usually says, well, they claim uh, a, f a number of people claim asylum in France and we cannot repat return them to the country where they should have been applying for asylum, which is Italy. We, I can tell you there has been 40,000 people in 2017 al alone that crossed the border from Italy to France. They applied for asylum there. France caught them and they would like to send them back. They cannot. So I know there are two sides to this issue. Clearly, uh, the fact that French, that French anyway authorities bring people back without asking whether they want to claim for asylum is against, uh, against uh, uh, domestic and European law. Um, Adama, I saw you nodding there. Did you want to get in on that? I would want to say that at the end of the day, the 21st century, even towards the end of the 20th century, uh, are eras that are really uh, marked by a new way of coloniz colonialization. Uh, this is a way of projecting power without sending military might, nor even controlling ports or forts. You just have to control the money. You need to control the decision makers, and that's what they have been doing. They position leaders who are democratically illegitimate. You see them corrupt. You see them facing problems within their countries, not respecting democratic rules. Case in point, is in my country, in Senegal, where Mr. Macky Sall, for instance, is widely unpopular, yet he expects to be re-elected in the first round by depending on outsiders, whether it's China or France or other forces. This should be stopped. And some of the companies 
like uh, the total to whom it has, has given the uh, uh, two uh, hydrocarbon blocks, uh, those kind of forces, interlop forces, could be really negative against the will and the possibilities, the exceptional uh, opportunities that our countries have now to start a new day in the life of the continent. Okay, so, so I think we so, need okay, to have so let me, a candid discussion Adama, Adama, with me, France and other forces. Okay, so Jacques, let me, let me bring mm -hmm. you into this um, conversation. So what about Europe somehow coming together to have a more unified approach um, to investment and development in, in Africa that would, that would make people not want to leave, not feel like they have to leave? Yeah, we know it's one of the big challenges. That's the good. demography of Africa is, is, uh, is so strong, so dynamic, that we know there will be mil uh, over one billion people soon, and that uh, Africa is not enough, has not, enough, has not got the economic means to feed all these people, and therefore that uh, there will be pressure for people to migrate to richer areas, and therefore there is a need, an awareness that there is a need to, to help Africa develop. That's at the moment it revolves at the at the level of resolve and talk. It's crucial. Migration won't stop because for for that reason. And you know the previous speaker was talking about France, France, France. But let's say that France used to be the dominant partner in French-speaking Africa, but no longer is. It's no longer the Crédit Lyonnais or Total who are ruling the show there. You know very well that the Chinese are there, the Russians are there, uh, the Saudis are buying uh, land there. Everyone is there. Africa is a treasure chest. And it's time for African countries to see that, to try to sort out the problem within the country. They can, all the leaders can back, uh, are using the mineral resources of their countries to stay in power. To corrupt. Okay, well Jacques, Jacques. All, all that stone. The problem is not just to do with the French and European. It's to do with African leaders themselves, and it's to do with okay, other let me, countries let me, which are trying to pillage this. Uh, okay, let this me region. let me bring the conversation back a little. I, I hear what you're saying. Let me p p focus it back um, to immigration, and you know that's what France and Italy are both dealing with. Um, Matteo, what does Italy want from the European Union when it comes to immigration? Well, Italy wants solidarity. That's one word for it. They want, uh, they want to for all Europe to come together and uh, find a way and workable solution to, for irregular migration and for so for asylum seekers. Just look at this. Going back to development, we know that development will not stop migration from Africa. Actually, we have all evidence that as mo the more uh, African countries develop, given that they are all low-income countries, the more they go towards middle-income the more intentional migration will rise. And yes, they are already 1 billion, there will be 2 billion in 2040. So we know migration cannot be stopped. My institute just estimated that by 2040, there will be 8 million more Sub-Saharan Africans coming to Europe. So we need to wait to manage that. And it's not going to be that hard. 8 million might, be, that might seem so much. But if you compare it to, for example, just Italian population, that's 12%. So people could say, ah, we are invited. But if we found a way to cope together, we have 500 million people in Europe. So 8 million Sub-Saharan Africans, that's 1.5% 1, 1 of the total. So Italy, Spain, Greece, they're asking for solidarity. Uh, France has, is doing some something. Uh, Germany has done a lot. There are many other countries that are not doing as, as much, and so we have to find a way so it to sounds like, cope with that together. It sounds like you're saying that immigration doesn't have to be a bad thing, that people don't have to describe it in such a negative term as, as an invasion, it, it, as long as they welcome it and, and plan for it. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. I mean, migration is a challenge. It brings some challenges and some benefits. Irregular migration is more of a challenge. We know there are many more. It's much more difficult to integrate these people. It's much more b difficult to bring them towards, you know, a way to find them a job. We know that by f in five years uh, since they landed, uh, just one in four will be employed. Usually, labor migration eight in t eight in ten, so eighty percent will be employed by five. You know, after five years being in another country. So we know there, is, there are challenges. We must prepare for that. 
Clearly, Italy was not prepared with its asylum system and reception system, but the whole of Europe was not. And there are some countries, especially in the eastern parts of Europe, that want to benefit from the EU but do not want to share into the solidarity. So clearly, that's not a, a problem with France. That's not a problem with Germany. Actually, France, Germany, Austria, they've been doing a lot for migration. So uh, that's clearly not uh, the way. I mean, Italy should cooperate with Italy, uh, sorry, with France uh, and not accuse it if we want to solve this problem together. Jacques, what, what really is at play here, this, this back and forth um, that seems to be getting lower and lower between Italy and France? What, what's it really at play here? Uh, at play is the looming European election. It's a very important issue for Matteo Salvini and for the Italians, and it's also an issue for all the populist movements in, uh, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, Orban and so on. Uh, Matteo Salvini knows that in France, there are movements of protest, such as uh, the Yellow Vest, that's Marine Le Pen, the leader, which is, who is very close, a friend of him, who is uh, ready, to, who is hoping to capitalize, and they want to be overrepresented in the next European Parliament election. And therefore, they are using issues such as immigration, which is a very sensitive issue uh, all over Europe, in order to kind of boost their case. And I was agreeing with uh, Matteo, it's true that what needs to be done, it's not to have a national, uh, national fights. And, you know, we know that Italy is a country which has taken the brunt of this illegal immigration of these people, of the boat people crossing the Med, uh, the Mediterranean and ending in Italy because of the Dublin, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Dublin Pact. Uh, which means that uh, the country have to claim asylum in the country where they arrive. That needs to be changed at European level, but nobody, uh, most of the other countries don't want it. Uh, most countries, we should have a quota system in order to welcome them. So we know okay. that it could be important to have that, but it's an issue which at the moment is used purely as a way to fan the flames of political dissent and boost uh, some of the movements capitalizing on the fears of uh, many people who think there is an invasion, but well, there's okay. no invasion so, at all. So hold on, let me yeah. put that. Let me put that to Adama. Adama. So as Jacques pointed out, a lot of this is about politics. A lot of politicians aren't talking about solutions. They're using this to to kind of get their fan base going. If you take the politics out of it, what would you like to see the European do to address the issue of, of African migrants coming? I think we need to go back to the drawing board. Let's acknowledge facts that are often op forgotten in the debate. First of all, Africans, when they migrate, they migrate within Africa. They are much more migrants within Africa than towards Europe or America. It's not a problem. Let's be blank about it. Secondly, let's also our partners of so-called developed world accept what we have agreed to be a common policy. That's World Trade Organization. It was established to allow free movement of good services, but also, yes, people. This is part of the agreement. You cannot take the best, go and send your services, your banks, your multinationals in Africa and not allow Africans to migrate. This, after all, was what Europe did to Africa when they sent their imperial power in the 19th century in Africa. That's what they did to America. Why would they prevent Africans traveling? This is part of globalization. I think we should not be shy about recalling the facts. That's the second one. The third one is this. You, somebody alluded to the fact that the Russians the Chinese and the likes of the Indians are coming into Africa. Yes, that's very good. It, it, you have to open up the process to ensure that Africa does not sit one to one with one imperial power. We need others to come in. And I can guarantee you, as somebody who has written almost the first book on China and Africa, that China at this moment, despite the importance of its commercial links with Africa, is not dominating the continent. What is worse is the mere fact today Adama, that we're outside have... European nations and America are backtracking from what they used to call good governance, good norms. They are following 
the norms of outside forces, and that is the bad problem. Okay, and that will have to be the final word on this discussion. Gentlemen, thank you all very much. Adama Guy, Jacques Rollo, and Matteo Villa, thank you. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you visit our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.